Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi subhanalladhi hadana lihada wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadana Allahu laqad jaat rusulu rabbana bilhaq. Qalu subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma allamtana inna ka anta alimul hakim. Rabbi shrahli sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqtata min lithani yafkahu qawli yufawwidu amri ilallah basirun bil'ibad. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen khatimin nabiyyin abil qasim muhammad wa ala ahli bayti hi tayyibin al-tahirin al-ma'asimin al-lazhi azhabu allahu ankum al-ridsa ahla al-bayti wa yutahhirakum tathira Allahumma salli ala muhammadi wa ala muhammad inna allah wa malaikatuhu yusalluna ala al-nabiyya ayyuhu al-lazina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Assalamu alaykum Allahumma salli ala muhammad Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Bismillah, we start with our journey to Surah Fatiha once again and uh, we have been discussing Allah's name, Al, um, Al Malik, because we've been talking about the ayah of Surah Fatiha, uh, Maliki Yomitin. Now, the reason I was so excited about today's class is because um, I was really intrigued. Why is it that Allah uses the word Malik and not Malik? And what is the difference? Uh, just a second. And um, I went into um, a lot of uh, study of that word, consulted a few people, and um, it, what, what came out was really profound. So before we go into discussing the difference of the word, I want to take up the whole ayat of Maliki Yomitin and talk about it in the present moment as we usually do. And uh, we have discussed earlier that Yom in Quran is not just a day, but Yom means a, a fraction of a moment, uh, a unit of a moment. It could be a billionth of a second. So it's a moment, it's a day, it's a period of time. So when we're saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that he is Maliki Yom Ittin, that means that he is the master of the moment of what? What is deen? And uh, the meaning that I found most uh, apt to understand something that can be extremely transformative for us in this ayat is uh, deen means a moment of surrender. Now, the moment where you surrender. So... Malik Iyamidin, that means he is the master of the moment of surrender. He is the master of the moment of my accountability. And my moments of accountability are all the moments of my life. Um, we have to answer and be accountable for this gift of life. And the moment of my accountability, therefore, is every moment that I breathe every moment that I am living. And uh, there's this, uh, there's this uh, small story from the son of Imam Khomeini. And uh, we hear that uh, when uh, Imam Khomeini passed away, uh, uh, the, the son of Imam Khomeini dreamt of him, Rahmatullahi. And he said that my father came in my dream and I asked him, what is it like there? What, what is it that you would like to tell me after going there? And he said that my father told me that even this movement of your finger, you have to, you have to be accountable for it. So every single thing you have to be accountable for, you have to be answerable. So Allah says in the Quran that I did not create you, illa liyabudun, uh, but to worship me. To be an Abd. Abd is the one who has surrendered. Now, when we look at this idea that the purpose of life is nothing but to surrender, so Allah is also saying, I'm the master of your moments of surrender, and all the moments of my life are my moments of surrender, and Allah is the Mali, and I am accountable for every moment of my life. Now, let's put it all together, let's connect it all together. Generally speaking, the idea of Yom al is usually taken as day of judgment. 
And we are saying that instead of thinking of one day that's going to come in our future and one day which we are waiting for and one day when, you know, one day, one day in future, let's think of, as I've always said, that in Arabic, uh, the future and the present tense are the same. And I really went into a good deep journey into Quranic grammar this time because of these words. So that tense in Arabic is called Fele Mazare. Okay, and fele mazare means a verb which is happening in the present and future. So that means that whatever we're talking about is not just in the future, but it has a reality right now. And our teachers and mystics would always say that your heaven is now, your hell is now, your day of judgment is now. And now we know with all these years of you know research and studying and you know uh, reflection that we all have an inner reality within us at all times, which is a bigger reality, which is a greater reality, which is the reality of my thoughts, the reality of my emotions, and the reality of my inner weather, my inner temperature. So in order for me to be in that moment of accountability, I have to awaken to the reality that I I'm in a moment of accountability in every moment and my God is the master of that moment. And how do I surrender in this moment? How, how do I achieve a moment of surrender in every moment? Because this is a moment of surrender. This is a moment of accountability. Now, when an employee is working for a boss, they have to be accountable to that boss for everything they do, right? So there's an acceptance that I am the up and I have a malik. First of all, there has to be that humility to accept that I am the up and there is a malik, a master, and I am accountable to that master. And that true humility, that true understanding of being a needy, accountable servant of God comes when we go through trials and tribulations in life where we feel completely helpless, when we come to our knees. And in those moments of complete need and helplessness and confusion and doubt, uh, we realize that there is really no one who understands us as much as our rub, you know, no matter how close anyone is. Uh, it is only going to be Allah where you feel this discomfort of being completely understood. Now, one more thing that happens, I have seen with um, a few people, you know, people talk, talk about their difficult times. I noticed that a lot of times they would say that, you know, my last thread of support is gone. Like someone would pass away or they'd have to move cities or um, you know, there'd be a disconnection or they'd fall into a fight. Something happens. And then this person already in a state of tribulation will find themselves completely left alone. And now there, there is no one in their life they feel who's supporting them. Somebody who they felt were their support will be gone. It, it's a n- number of times I've seen it that people would be telling me that, I was going through this difficulty and then that happened. And then, you know, this, that's that last hope, the last person who was there for me also left. So we see that somehow Allah isolates us. Allah kind of takes away all the other pseudo support systems and he leaves us with him alone. And that kind of reminds us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is isolating us, cornering us to come to a place of realization of completely being helpless. And the only power that then shines to us is that inner, inner connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something within us which is telling us, I have somebody I can talk to. I have somebody who understands me. I have some power greater than me who's holding me, helping me breathe, wake up every morning, bringing the sun out. And really, there, no matter how much you talk, we talk about mindfulness and no matter how much we talk about um, being in a state of presence and connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we keep falling into slumber. You know, the, there, is a, there is this addiction to 
seeking support, love, emotional help, um, you know, all of that in human beings. And Allah has kept it that way. He has made them the zarai. He has made them the wasilas. He's made them the conduits of his love and support. All, everything in this dunya is a means. He is the source. So we constantly keep forgetting the source and we get, you know, immersed in this addiction to find our healing support, um, solace in people or things, you know, or, or situations. Sometimes taking a vacation becomes that means, but we think this is the source and we get, we get very um, fixated on the idea that, oh, I really need a vacation without it, I can't function. And then pandemic came and it kind of like shook us and said, well, now what are you going to do? So you have to go within yourself, not outside for your break, for your vacation. What are you going to do? Everybody's home. You can't even get time to, to have tea or watch TV. Kids are home with their school. You know, everybody's home. So we were, we were finding that, you know, we, were, we would run away from ourselves. We would want to escape our own selves and find distractions that would give us that temporary feeling of, of relief. And then Allah puts us in this situation where we feel like this is the worst that could happen and then the worst would happen. You know, like your your the final thread would break and you'd be like, okay, now I'm really, you know, sinking. And it's in that feeling of feeling completely, you know, feeling like you're gonna drown in that moment of darkness, which Allah says in the Quran that you're in the middle of the sea in the storm. Who are you gonna call upon? You know, who are you going to remember who's there? So in that moment of feeling nothing, in that moment of feeling uh, not just a, a brainy idea, not just a mental idea of saying, I'm helpless, you know, no, Allah is my rub, but really intrinsically feeling it in your bone and really feeling that anxiety of saying, oh my God, where am I? How am I going to get out of this? Who's going to fix this? This does not look like my cup of tea. And then feeling this overwhelming overload of a situation where you feel completely out of your wits and saying, oh my God, how am I going to deal with this? In that moment of complete helplessness and humility, we find ourselves running back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the true state of being an out. And that slave dumb, that feeling of nothingness in front of the master is the sweetest feeling of knowing I am held. I'm protected. Everything's going to be okay. It's in the hand of the one who says, but everything is good in my hands. And he says that, you know, he's Allah Kulishain Khalil. And then he says, everything is easy for me, right? And then he, so one after another, he fills us with this hope. So now when we come back to Maliki Omidin, we want to see if everything is in the hands of God. And if I am a servant, I'm really nothing, then is this what Shakespeare and a lot of these people would uh, you know, allude to? That is this like a puppet show? Everything's just happening according to his will. Do I really have a will? You know, this whole dis discussion on free will is what I'm gonna touch today. And um, coming back to the idea of Yom Din, the moment of accountability, um, the moment of accountability is the moment of awakening, all right? Awakening to this moment. Waking up from the slumber of autopilot of the life, taking it you in its flow. But waking up and being conscious of this moment, being really alive in this moment and saying, okay, wait a second. In this moment, I am here and this is the situation and consciously deciding how to take the next step. That's the pause. That's the pause that wakes us up, okay? And that's why in that pause, I can be accountable to myself and hence accountable to my Allah in saying, how do I take this next step? Which we often forget. I often forget. I'm talking about myself most of the time, of course. And despite all the, the talk of mindfulness, I usually keep falling into this slumber and then I have to wake up and say, 
wait a second, how do I move next? And then aligning my intention and then saying, every step I take, I want it to be a step closer to Allah. How can I take this step? So that becomes a, a moment of awakening, a moment of seeing a light, a, a moment of being accountable. Now, when we talk about Maliki or Medin, I want to narrate a little incident I had with myself. And I was sitting with a scholar and uh, I had some questions about the, about Bibi Mariam, I think. And um, I had built up a theory in my head, um, much like the way I come here with my theories and insights and then I impose it and everybody, sorry about that. But uh, honestly, these are just my humble opinions and insights and uh, I'm here to be corrected and I'm learning just like you all as a student. Anyway, so in my arrogance, I go to this teacher with my, my theory all set in my head. And I have this story about Bibi Mariam, which I want to apparently ask the teacher, but I didn't realize that I was not in that state of accountability. And I was going on that autopilot egoistic mode where I was just unintentionally going to this teacher to to impose my idea on him and be proven right and be validated and then somehow feel good about my opinion. Um, and the, the outcome in my mind was that the teacher would be like, yeah, Fatma, you're right. And yeah, that's how it is, right? So that, that was the mindset I was going in, which I realized much later. And I'm sitting with this teacher and, um, you know, I ask the question and the teacher starts to talk and I don't realize that I'm not even listening. I'm not listening. I'm just hearing for the sake of replying constantly. So I do that a couple of times. And this teacher, subhanAllah, was a, is a mystical teacher, very, very, you know, um, mature, mystical teacher. And he caught on and he turned around and he said, sister, you're not listening, you know. And... Um, it was such a shock for me because in that moment, I was telling myself, no, I'm listening. Of course I'm listening, you know? And I was not breaking out of that cycle of egoistically, you know, being in a state of slumber. So when he said that, I I don't remember anything after that. I just remember breaking out of this sleep and uh, getting a shock in my system and just remembering that I completely forgot about what I was talking about. I did not get the answer that I'd gone to discuss. So the, the, the niyat that I had said before going, I said, Allah, I'm doing, I, wanna, I wanna go and meet this teacher to come closer to you, right? In my mind, I'm thinking I'm going to get closer to Allah by getting some answers, some intellectual food for thought, some knowledge, something like that. But my food from Allah came in a completely different way. It came with an awakening, with a moment of like a slap on my face. And the teacher turned around and woke me up saying, you're not listening. You're not here to listen. Pay attention. Like, what are you doing? And uh, after that, I just... I just remember going into a different state where I was um, in a self-introspective state, but it was so difficult for me to come out of that space of my idea and my mind and my insight and the sense of embarrassment that, you know, the teacher could see through and through me. He could see my, uh, my, you know, inclination and the fixation to the outcome and how he jolted me. And then when I came home, um, I remember sitting and crying like a baby. I just cried and I cried and I cried. And um, in that moment, I had a realization about Maliki Yomitin. And the realization was that God is the master who takes over your moment of accountability sometimes when you go to sleep. So when you yourself forget to be accountable, Allah will bring you to that place of accountability. I had gone to sleep. 
I had forgotten about my accountability. I had gone into a slumber, like a hypnotic, egoistic state. But because of the setting of the intention, so I forgot to mention, right? Before I went, I made this prayer to Allah that I want to bring, I want to come close to you through this interaction. When you set that intention, Allah takes over. And even if you if you're falling, he's just gonna pick you up and bring you back up. He's gonna pull you by your collar and say, sit and hear and listen. I'm here and I'm gonna teach you. And this kind of teaching is called. Ilmul Huduri, the knowledge of the presence, the knowledge of, uh, uh, yeah, the knowledge of the experiential knowledge, not conceptual knowledge, not knowledge that you gain by reading a book or reading a sentence or hearing a lecture. This is a knowledge that really seeps into your heart. It comes through an experience. And um, the idea, uh, this idea of experience, experiential knowledge um, was expounded by the great uh, philosopher Sohravardhi. And uh, therefore, Ilmul Huduri comes to us when we seek it. We ask Allah SWT, we say, Allah, I want you to give me direct teaching and learning. It comes when, you know, we seek the surrender of the Abd the moment of surrender in Maliki Yom Deen. I said, Deen has another translation, which means moment of surrender. Okay, so I had put this question that is Allah really the one controlling everything and we're just puppets or do we have a free will? Now, I've asked this question to a lot of scholars and um, one, some scholars would say, well, the idea of free will and uh, destiny is something beyond the material realm. So you need to enter the immaterial realm, a, a, a deeper state of you know, connecting to God to understand these ideas, uh, something like Ilmul Huduri, uh, something that cannot be put into words. Some teachers would say, well, lift your hand right now and I lifted my hand and said well if you can lift your hand right now with your own free will you have free will right now um so they would say that in this moment you have free will but overall it is Allah's will and you know these ideas they they they're all there there are different ways of um, approaching this topic of free will and destiny and I want to share uh, another ask another way of looking at it today is we can never reach reach complete knowledge. We don't, we're not capable of that. Um, we cannot be final about anything that we learn. Um, according to my teacher, there is no knowledge outside, like one of the teachers I studied with. And so knowledge is the inner assimilation, the inner you know, works of the soul that gives us any intellectual knowledge. So right now, how do we understand that if Allah is the Malik, and if Allah is going to take over everything, where is my free will? And how do I understand the Malik? And what is this surrender? So I gave you the example of my moment where I felt like Allah surrendered me. He really like woke me up and showed me that I am the master. And the reason I had this aha moment uh, when I was crying and my mind went into Maliki Yomitin. The moment, the, the, the master of the moment of accountability is because I felt Allah's power overtake my power. And I felt Allah really helping me surrender because I felt this huge um, stubbornness within me that was preventing me from listening, from being a humble listener to my teacher. And I felt really grateful to Allah SWT in that moment of bringing me to that place. So I felt like there was a power that overtook anything that I was creating, a stubbornness. It overtook that, right? That's why I felt the power of the Malik. So now let me share with you my findings with the name Malik and Malik. Now in Arabic grammar, um, there are two ways of looking at an action. 
So one is um, the, okay, in Urdu it's easier, but I'm going to try and explain it through English grammar. So um, when an action is in motion without the actor, without the perpetrator, without the person who's performing the action, um, then that act in motion, just the act in motion is called, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's an, um, it's in Arabic, well, well, in the grammatical sense, it's called uh, isme mastar. So it's a noun. It's a noun of the action. So the, the act of washing itself without the washer, it's called a wash, right? The whole, the whole experience of the wash, it's, the, it's a wash. Or a hit, I took a hit, right? Now, I'm me taking a hit, it's, it's an action, but it's on its own. It's an action in motion, but it's on its own. I'm not talking about who hit me, what it hit, but the hit, the hit, you know, the hit, that's perfect. So like the, the fact that I'm calling it the hit gives it that station of uh, being a proper noun. Like it's, an, it's a noun in itself. So the hit, the wash, the cleaning, um, the run, the run was excellent. All right, like that. So that becomes a particular kind of noun in the Arabic language. So there is that, and then um, there is the actor who's doing it. My washing, I did the washing, she did the washing, she, he hit me, I ran. Now that is the act with the person who's acting. So these are two different kinds of acts. Uh, two different kinds of uh, ways of looking at an at an action, and when we look at these acts, um, we see that these acts on their own uh, can be can be now divided into two categories in um, the Arabic language. I'm going to struggle a little bit, but I really want to get this across because I didn't realize that when I was discussing it with somebody else, I think I just did it in Urdu. Okay, so, okay. Okay, just forget about what I just said. I'm just gonna go um, and do it all over again. So, so when we're looking at, um, Okay, let, let's just do, do Malik and Malik because I got lost in other words. So there is Malik and Malik and Mulk and uh, Milk. Okay, that's why I got confused, I'm sorry. So let's forget about Milk and Mulk because that's where I was going. Um, and if this wasn't a live uh, recording, I would have just gone back and deleted it. Um, so Malik and Malik. Now Malik and Malik both are words that describe Ownership, masterdom, sovereignty, um, uh, and being a king. Okay, so a lot of times it will be uh, uh, translated as kingdom, or the one who has a kingdom, the sovereign king of a kingdom. Now the difference between Malik and Malik is that, and in Urdu we use these words a lot. Okay, so that's why for us, it's very easy to use Malik and Malik. Now in, in Malik, the quality of being a Malik, of being a king is like the quality of being kind. Kindness is something I hold in my heart and it stays in my heart and it doesn't come and go. I am a kind person. I am a generous person. I am a... Um, and, uh, I, like these qualities are intrinsic. They're, they're not dependent on a manifestation. It's a quality in my character. So being kind will manifest itself through an action. But kindness is something I hold intrinsically within me. 
in the same way allah subhanahu taala is the malik he is the owner intrinsically it's not like his ownership stops and continues there are no breaks are you all with me if i can get a okay thank you i can see the cmt model so thank you really thank you fatma also okay so so malik will be a quality which is within me which is continuous which i hold within me as a character malik on the other hand is a quality which manifests itself and then unmanifests itself sometimes it is there and then it's not there for example hitting somebody can hit but you're not continuously hitting you hit and then you don't hit it's not something that can go on all the time so you can be a malik and then it's not a continuous act it it happens and then it doesn't happen and then it happens and it doesn't happen it's not a continuous thing and my question was um, why hasn't allah said malik malik e yomiti instead of saying malik e yomiti because i would think allah is my master all the time so the so so my my understanding would be that well allah should be malik e yomiti all the time because he's the master why would allah use the word malik anyway at any time he doesn't he doesn't ever stop being my master right that that's is what we're taught so when the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked ask this question um i also want to bring this up here that the 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 zair zabar page the gamma kasra in the quran that came a lot later right initially none of that was there so without the the zabar page and zair and the dhammas and the kasras um we could have said malik as mulk milk malik ma- malik anything right because there was no indications on it so when the prophet was asked uh, peace and blessings upon him he said both malik and malik are correct and we know that malik is uh continuous and malik is inundated right malik is not continuous so when the prophet is saying both apply then there is wisdom in there and i was really trying to grasp that and now in the context of whatever i've already said being in the present moment being accountable letting go of the egoistic mind surrendering to allah subhanahu wa taala the way malik works is that the whole this is all my in you know interpretation and insight into it and i may be entirely wrong but this is just how i understood and it clicked for me malik is the god my allah subhanahu wa who is controlling everything all the time we know that everything is in his control there is no entity other than him there is no reality other than him there is no existence other than him there is no life other than him we are all part of the same consciousness it is one nafsul wahid so in that sense allah subhanahu wa taala is the malik all the time in control and the prophet is saying yes you can recite it as maliki or anything too and that makes complete sense right however going back to my incident with the teacher i did feel that there was some conscious effort going from my part into that situation that brought in that help from allah subhanahu wa taala because there will be a lot of people who will not have these moments of awakening and they will just go through it uh in a very egoistic manner we go through a lot of experiences with people we can sometimes see are acting in a very egoistic way but their shell doesn't break they stay in their stubbornness even quran is saying you know that there's a seal on their hearts they don't break out of that shell they're just stuck they're stubborn so isn't allah the malik there too allah is malik there too and allah was malik here too and please forgive me i'm using my own example because i don't have any other example so just think of an xyz person but how did it how did this help from allah come in the journey of the soul and why doesn't it come to some people apparently to us right even though it is allah's promise all of us will reach him inna ka kadhan kadhan for mulaki all of you are striving and all of you will reach him that there is no doubt about that but then some are some 
some are given this opportunity to awaken to their uh, mistakes. Some are given the opportunity to see where to wake up. Why does that happen? And for that, I want to bring in this idea of Maliki Yomadeen. Because while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the master over all situations in every way, he is also the one who gives us this opportunity where he says, you have a free will and your free will is whether you will connect with me or not in that moment. And so the only free will we hold in any moment is, is as if I have a bodyguard, I have a teacher, I have a guide with me at all times and there are certain services I will be receiving at all times continuously but then there will be some, some services that I will be able to make use of and benefit from only if I seek the help so while I have this bodyguard next to me and while I have this teacher next to me all the time I will have to approach and say could you please come and help me on this why why is that have you not? I noticed this a lot about myself. Have you noticed, especially teenagers, you tell them to do something, they will not do it. They'll do the opposite. You know, they don't want to be told. And seriously, we, we use this example of Hazrat Adam so often. That Allah told him, don't go near the tree, he went. Okay? We have this fitrat within us as a human being. We don't like to be nagged. You know, we don't like to be told all the time. We don't like to be pushed and forced into doing anything. That's our fitrat. And Allah enjoys that about it. Allah loves that about that. That is the whole reason why we talk about heaven and hell and accountability. Because we have a portion of free will where we have the power, right? To change our life, to change our destiny, to change the constitution of our soul to change what Hazrat Hur did. He had that spark. He had that moment of accountability where he woke up and he had that awakening. He was in a state of slumber. He knew the knowledge was there. The information was there, but the transformation was missing, right? So what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does is that he gives us that power and he doesn't step in all the time unless we seek that unless we seek him because what's the point then if he's going to keep stepping in all the time then uh, then i have no free will i have no decision i have no power to decide anything um i have no space to say this was my journey and i curated it in a certain way this was my journey and i traversed it in a certain way this was my journey and i chose a certain path allah is giving us that so he will step in when we call upon him. He will step in when we ask him. And there's a certain protection and a certain uh, control and mastership he exercises over us at all times. But then there is a certain portion where he steps in only when we call upon him. Only when we wake up and say, I choose you as my God. That is why I want to bring in this very delicate point of connecting two ayats of the Quran, Maliki Yomidin and La Ikraha Fiddin. Both ayats use the word deen. And I said that deen also has a meaning of surrender. So one deen Allah is saying, I am the master of the moment of your surrender. And then he's saying, there is no force in your surrender. There is no force in your deen. So how is it that at one point he's saying, I'm the one in control. I'm the one controlling your surrender. And then he's saying, there's no force in surrender. Apparently, they would look like two contradictory ayats. Because a master is like this controlling master who controls everything. And on the other hand, he's saying, I'm giving you the freedom to choose. Like Rafidin, there's no force in your surrender. There's no force in your religion. There is no force in the way you choose to reach me. And there are only really two ways of reaching him, isn't it? Either I constantly connect to him and reach him or either I stay disconnected from him. And, you know, it was so profound that moment for me when I was looking at both of these ayats because 
we are therefore given this power to choose between heaven and hell. And in this present moment, we are, you, you all know that, you know, I always really emphasize on the idea of being in the present moment and talking about heaven and hell in this moment. In this moment, if I choose to decide that Allah, I am going to choose you as my Rab and my Malik and my, you know, Qazi and everything, my Wali, then I automatically enter a state of peace within me because now I know who my Wali is, the master of the world, the all-knowing, the all-wise, the creator, the, you know, the magnificent, the majestic, the omniscient, the omnipotent, that is my Wali. I'm choosing that with my heart, with my surrender, in my state of nothingness, in my state of turmoil, in my state of doubt and confusion, I make that choice of choosing my rub. And that is where I find my heaven in this dunya, because this dunya is a place of turmoil on the outside. But the one, the Oliya Allah, who chooses, chooses, that is the key, who chooses Allah in that moment, becomes the Wali, becomes the one who has now, Allah says, um, Allah says, when you remember me, I remember you. In, um, sorry, I'm not getting the Arabic. When you remember me, I remember you. When you make me your wali, I become your wali, right? When you become my friend, I become your friend. So it is that choice we have to make in every moment and saying, I choose you, I choose you, I choose you. So that finger that I talked about Imam Khomeini Ramadullah saying that you have to be answerable even for this movement of the finger. It's saying that in every moment I have to renew my pledge with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In every moment I have to make this choice. That is the amount of choice I have in this life. That every moment I am accountable for the choices I am making. In every moment I have the free will to choose. So in every moment will I choose Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be my wali to be my protector, to be my guardian. And that is why the word yom is used. It's a moment of accountability. And he is the malik and he is the malik. So while he will make sure, that's his promise and that is his control. While he will make sure that whether you go through heaven or whether you go through hell or whether you take a, a shortcut or whether you take the long route, you will reach me. That is his promise. So he is the malik in that sense. He's the master. He'll make sure you reach him. He's also the malik. He is giving you the choice whether you go through heaven to reach me or whether you go through hell to, to reach me. And in this world, we can't be deluded that we will not be tried or tested and tribulations won't come and anxieties won't come and Fears won't come and restlessness won't come and depression won't come. All of this is our, our journey. This is all part of what we signed up for. This is something we signed up for. The only thing that makes the difference is me realizing that in every moment will I sign my pledge and say, I choose you, my God. I don't rely on myself. I don't rely on your means. I will not rely on on the, the conduits as the source of my rahma, as the source of my comfort, as the source of my sakina and tranquility. Will I, will I think that my husband or my boss is the one who's giving me the risk? So I need to do something to get that out of them. Do I need to love my children to get love out of them? Do I need to give my services you know, to get something out of somebody? Do I need to um, think that if I have money, money, only then can my dreams come true? If I have a good degree, only then can I have a good job? All of these are conduits. They're not the source. So I need to leave all of these conduits, all of these means from my vision because they are the whales and say my direct source is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I always give this example and I'm going to repeat it here again. 
that there was a healer who gave an ointment to a to a person for healing and he put the ointment and his uh, zakham his wound got healed and he comes back to the healer and says oh thank you so much you really healed me thank you and he said astaghfirullah i only gave you the ointment healing came from allah subhanahu wa taala right to make that distinction in every moment and say my my dreams come true because allah makes them come true i can afford and buy and purchase and enjoy abundance because allah gives it directly to me i am loved because of allah putting love in the hearts of all these people i am doing whatever i'm doing smelling tasting touching all of this through these means all of these are means i had i had said this right when i did my session after covid that i had the tongue but i hadn't didn't have the taste everything was working fine but the consciousness the realization of a nama comes from within from that life force the source is allah so the enjoyment of food is not in the food i'm seeing outside on the table the enjoyment is within it's coming from the life force of god and so to remove these veils in every moment making the direct connection to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and saying this is all you these are all your means if a door has closed it was just a means another one will open because the source is you you can you know you can give it to me to me the flavor of enjoyment through a strawberry and you can give it to me through a mango you can pick and choose the means to reach me but it will all be you sending whatever is coming to me my risk in my soul the risk in my emotion the risk in my mental health the risk in my physical life all comes from you so not to be attached to the means detaching and in every moment making that decision that oh allah i choose you over everything else i want you in every moment but to make that pledge in every moment and i'm really tempted to share one more uh, insight here about the promise of the allah to and allah said you know uh allah to be rabbikum qalu bala am i not your lord and he said yes and the mystics would always say that this is not a promise that was done millions of years ago in the uh, realm of you know alamul arwah or you know um all the alamizar where we were we were uh, we were not we were in, in a state of particle like that's why they call it alamizar like zarra um was it done so many years ago and allah is saying you made that promise and now you don't remember and you said yes and the mountains couldn't do it and the clouds couldn't do it and the sky couldn't do it but the human took that promise the mystics say that this is a promise that is happening now now right now the promise is there so right now allah is asking am i not your lord in every moment when he's saying i'm your malik he's giving you that choice in every moment and in every moment he's saying will you not choose me as the one who nourishes you will you not choose me as the one who can protect you will you not choose me to hand over your worries to me will you not choose me to be your friend when you're alone will you not choose me as the one who loves you more than 70 mothers will you not choose me as the one you can be yourself with and just look at the mercy of that beautiful god like he is that king who has all the time in the world for each one of us and in every moment he's giving us this opportunity to choose to choose to choose to choose and that is the biggest gift and the mercy i see that allah gives us his expansiveness is manifesting through this idea of him giving us this choice constantly and that's why in every moment of accountability 
Allah Ta'ala is giving us the choice to either live an intentional life or an unintentional life. He makes the difference between the conscious and the unconscious, right? The awakened and the unawakened. The ones whose eyes have opened and the ones who are sleeping. And this uh, Carl Jung, the psychologist, he's beautifully said these words. He said, unless you bring the subconscious to the conscious, life will keep happening to you and you will call it fate. And um, a lot of times when people come to me, you know, initially when they haven't had these kind of talks or reflections, there is so much pain in their life. There is so much suffering. There is so much, you know, it's our human state. We complain and we whine and we went because we are seeking relief. We are sick of being sick. We're tired of the burden of this pain in our hearts. And people come and they're sharing their grief and they look like they're really suffering. But the promise of God is not that the pain on the outside will go away. His promise is, Allah bi dhikrullah it's at my The outside is not going to really completely vanish and the tribulations are not going to go away. But the, the one who will connect to the Malik will enter a state of peace within. And, and that is a conscious way of doing life. So we understand that pain is inevitable, but suffering is a choice. Again, the choice. So if I make the choice of saying yes to Allah SWT, yes, I come back to you. Yes, I come back to you in every moment. That's when I find peace in my heart and I enter my heaven in this moment and I make the choice of choosing heaven over hell and I make the choice of choosing a conscious life. And you know, like uh, our sheikh would give the example of Leila and Tess. And he would say, what if, what if Tess was in front of Leila? And Leila said, what do you want? And instead of asking for Leila herself, Tess would ask for a castle or a car or a house or a horse or whatever. It would be so ridiculous because for Tess, Leila is the biggest gift. And so for us, can I, can I come to a place, oh Allah, where for me, I want nothing but you. And, you know, Allah says that there are going to be different levels of Jannah. And of course, we, we again talk about it in the present sense. So if there are different levels of Jannah, then right now in this moment, you know, there is a level of Jannah, which is about asking for things and, you know, asking for security of my children and asking for financial security. And that's the kind of Jannah I can ask for. And then there's that higher Jannah where there's constant connection and peace and conversation with my Allah where I feel I talk to him and he talks to me. What can be greater than two lovers being in conversation together? What can be more beautiful than that? And that's what we get in our constant making of that choice with Allah Subhanahu So, just to wrap it up now, how do I make that choice? How do I say yes to Allah in every moment? And how do I feel this connection where I'm talking to him all the time and he's talking to me? First of all, all of us have done it. We all talk to Allah all the time. We all hear his voice all the time. We're all in that state all the time. But yes, we become oblivious to it. But if we try to recall, all of us will for sure recall some moments in our life where we felt connected to Allah. How to bring it into our conscious practice is literally by verbalizing these words, Qurbatan ilallah. That's it. Everything you do, you seek the proximity of Allah SWT. It is in this, it's, it's like this humil humble state where, you know, you have a friend and uh, a friend who's constantly been leaving you voice messages and emails and everything is going into spam and you didn't know. And you think this friend has abandoned you. 
but still you go back and keep calling the friend keep calling the friend keep calling the friend realizing that the friend was always your friend close to you talking to you so allah is constantly sending us messages and emails and talking to us and sending us gifts and blessings we think he's not there and even if we think he's not there and even if we think he's abandoned me and even if he which is not possible uh, he doesn't ever but even if i have that guman even if i have that shock and doubt that he's left me still having the humility and saying can you be my friend can i be your friend again can i be close to you i really really love you and when the mystics will talk about uh, the story of the beloved and the lover the mystics will always talk about egolessness and they will say when two friends who are you know egoless who are in a divine bond of friendship there is no ego there even if the love is so unconditional that even if you don't get anything from one side the other side is always bowing down in complete humility and saying i am here to give my life for you whether you do anything or not blessed are the people who experience that kind of love in their lives with human beings in this dunya even though it's very painful i i know a lot of people who have experienced this where they're in love with another human being to the level where they're willing to give their lives for them but they're not getting much in return and i feel like while on the outside it looks like a very unfair deal while on the outside it looks like how unfair these people are giving so much love and not getting the love in return trust me allah has chosen this path for them because he's taking them to him because that's what a loving allah looks like Allah loves us without asking anything in return. And so these people are experiencing Allah's love of giving unconditionally. Honestly they're really lucky. And that's why the one who is the giver is emulating Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's closer to Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. The giver is always closer to Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, uh I was really uh invested in this session today because I was really enjoying it. I was really immersed. I don't know what all I've said but I really felt this excitement and joy in saying the things that I said because for me that was me listening um these praises of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala and I was really excited because of these insights so I hope I've not confused anyone but is in Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala so beautiful like you just feel this awe you just feel so excited to be his abd you know alhamdulillah alhamdulillah thank you fatma and fam and thank you nasim aunty everyone um i will end now with a dua bismillah rahman rahim oh allah there is no limit to praising you if the trees were pens and the oceans were ink there is no way we could ever finish writing your praises Oh Allah everywhere we look your miracles are everywhere everywhere we look your mercy is everywhere you always create order out of chaos you always show creation in destruction we get eluded and deluded and we lose our way and we get worried in our anxieties and our stress not realizing whose hands we are in there is a safety net of my rub that protects me so much that even when i'm a loser i'm a winner oh allah help me realize this oh allah awaken me in every moment oh allah purify my intentions in every moment bring me closer to you oh allah enable me to know my my flaws to know my darknesses Ola enable me to be humbled to find the humility of feeling the nothingness that brings me closer to you. Ola fill my heart with your awe in every moment. Ola you are the one who says kulla yawmin huwa fi shan. In every yawm in every moment you show a new manifestation. Ola that is a gift for your special friends ola show that show that manifestation to our hearts eyes open the eyes of our heart ya allah awaken us 
O Allah, bring sugar in our hearts and remove the kufr. O Allah, we come to you humbled and helpless. Hold us. And with your holding, bring us to our destination in safety and security of your love and peace. With the wasila of your beloved holy prophet and his holy blessed family. O Allah, hasten the reappearance of Al-Mahdi. Ameen, Ya Rabbul Alameen. If I can request you all to pray a Fatiha for the Marhumeen, for all the recent deaths, for all our friends and family who have lost someone, and also with the intention of healing for those who are suffering right now. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim.